Do you ever think about why you try to be a good person? Or better yet, do you ever think about how you try to be a good person? Hello and welcome. My name is Artem Alex and today I want to talk to you about the three main schools of normative ethics, including virtue ethics, consequentialist ethics, and lastly, deontological ethics. For each of these schools, we will go over their origin, principle, application, potential problem, as well as an example of the same sort of scenario and how each of the schools would act or react. Starting with the oldest of the three, virtue ethics. Virtue ethics actually originates thousands of years before most people are taught or think it originates. Virtue ethics actually originates all the way back to ancient Egypt, also known as Kemet, from around 3000 to 2000 BCE. Unfortunately, it is commonly taught that virtue ethics originates from Aristotle in the 300s BCE era in ancient Greece. However, this is not the case. <laughs> the principle of virtue ethics is that it is character-based. Through our virtues, our actions ought to bring more happiness and flourishing to the world, and with this we can all coexist happily on one planet. In its application, we are to follow our virtues and then, of course, avoid vices. But this does depend on where our virtues may come from. So, I have a list of different virtues coming from the ancient Egypt, Kemetic virtues, and ancient Greek. Greece. <laughs> Greek virtues. To start, Greek virtues include courage, temperance, liberality, magnificence, magnanimity, ambition, patience, friendliness, truthfulness, dandiness, wit, modesty, and justice. And then the vices include rashness or impulsiveness, being ascetic, extravagance, boastfulness, buffoonishness, bootlicking, boistering, submissiveness, retributive, single-mindedness, or obsession, and self-sacrificing. And then we have comedic virtues, which include eloquence, truthfulness, humility, reciprocity, impartiality, patience, precision in speech, kindness, education, enlightenment, silence, respectfulness, and integrity. And then vices include greed, partiality, crafty speech, gossip, lies, selfishness, rudeness, evil, and wickedness. Off the bat, one could think that these are very similar lists of great virtues, but when you actually look at how they differentiate, they paint very different people. <laughs> Where some of the virtues and vices are exactly the same, others are not at all the same. <laughs> and so largely the problem with virtue ethics is the large potentiality for ethnocentrism, where you believe that your beliefs are better than other people's. And this is largely because there is no international set of virtues and vices and beliefs. And so one could assume theirs is better, whereas it's not. It's just different. <laughs> Another point that one should consider when looking at virtue ethics is that the philosophy is incredibly self-orientated. It is all about the self and the self's character. While being a virtuous person is very fantastic and a great addition to society, this philosophy is entirely character-based in that it does not look to set a rule for society as much as it does itself, whereas other philosophies may include other people in how you should act for moral situations. <laughs> for our example today, for all of the schools of ethics, I want to ask you this. If you had superpowers, do you have to be a superhero? This doesn't necessarily have to include superpowers. It also could include intelligence or maybe that certain je ne sais quoi that makes it so maybe 
you could be the potential hero of the story. From the very commonly used hero's journey outline, every main character has a call to action that they at first refuse, but then of course realize that they have to take the call to action to move forward in the story. As viewers, we also realize they have to move forward or else there would be no story. <laughs> For instance, can you imagine if Bilbo stayed in Bag End and never went on his unexpected journey? That would be terribly boring. There wouldn't be three entire movies. You may be wondering why the refusal of the call is a necessary story device, but in fact, we often learn a lot about our main character in this moment and what is truly important to them, but really this is their ethical standpoint, their, their moral philosophy. In terms of virtue ethics and Bilbo Baggins, it is very likely that he saw a virtue of courage versus the vice of non-adventurism or being boring or lazy or whatever it may be. Going on the adventure is very courageous and that's a great virtue. More broadly, our superhero main character in Virtue Ethics would look at their own personal values as well as their social values. Being a superhero in Ancient Greece would be pretty easy as you can just be courageous and want justice, but at the same time, one of their vices is being self-sacrificing. And so maybe an ancient Greek superhero would be fantastic, but to a certain extent, as they may not put themselves in direct peril. To swing back to our pop culture references, this would be terrible in Klingon culture as dying in battle is actually an incredibly honorable thing to do, you know, one of the top most important virtues. To go back to the originators of virtue ethics, I think a superhero in ancient Egypt would probably be very different as to why they would be a superhero in the first place. Versus being very courageous and magnificent, an ancient Egyptian superhero might actually just want to be reciprocative of their fellow people and their home and respect it to protect it. But above all, I think it would be seen as selfish to hoard one's own ability to help stop any issues. And this could be even seen as wicked or evil in the long run. And so it is one's duty to to reciprocate their love for their people, to protect them. In conclusion with virtue ethics, I think in most people's cultures, if we can be a superhero, we would be, as this would point toward human flourishing. And that's really the, the base principle of virtue ethics. Next out of the three schools is consequentialism, also sometimes called utilitarianism. The origin of consequentialism is much more different than others as it kind of is a pretty vast wide school. There's there's many different potential origins. However, with utilitarianism, it can be pointed to pretty much two guys. Jeremy Bentham from England, 1748 to 1832, and John Stuart Mill, England, 1806 to 1873. However, consequentialism can also be dated all the way back to the 400 to 300 BCE era from Mozi or Mozu of ancient China. So, pretty cool, not just two British old guys. <laughs> the principle of consequentialism is that it is results-based or outcome-based ethics, meaning that the consequences of your actions actually create the moral meaning of your actions. So it, go it goes back in time. In Jeremy Bentham's Act Utilitarianism, all acts should look to maximize pleasure for the greatest number and minimize pain. And this evaluates our actions by their consequences and usefulness. In John Stuart Mill's Rule Utilitarianism, all acts should look to maximize happiness for the greatest number and minimize unhappiness. And this evaluates rules for their actions, for their consequences and usefulness. And then in Motsu's Moism, all acts should look to maximize social contributions, and in this we identify the Tao, or the way, the consequences, 
and the usefulness, with a emphasis on usefulness. The application of consequentialism is actually directly in its name. We are to consider the consequences of our actions, but it is how we consider the consequences that chooses which consequential philosophy we follow. For instance, in Bentham's act utilitarianism, we are to calculate the highest possible quantity of pleasure, and actions are right if they maximize utility. And then in Mill's rule utilitarianism, we are to calculate the highest quality of happiness, and actions are right if they abide by rules that maximize utility. And then in Moism, we are to calculate the highest possible social good, and then actions are right if they abide by the idea of what the action is and if it maximizes utility. As consequentialism originates from Moism, I actually also want to read us the ten core doctrines of the philosophy that they follow in choosing how they act. These ten core doctrines include promoting the worthy, identifying upward, universal love, condemning aggression, moderation in use, moderation in burials, aka like don't spend too much on someone's funeral, heaven's intent, understanding ghosts, condemning music, and condemning fatalism, fate itself. And so in looking at the difference between rule utilitarianism and act utilitarianism, Moism probably points more toward the rule utilitarianism because you are to look at what it is the way, the Tao, what is it supposed to be, and what do the doctrines say? But at the same time, it also highly looks for social good, and so the quality over quantity argument, it might just go somewhere in the middle. The largest problem with consequentialism ethics is that people can't see into the future, and what consequentialists do is largely use what the outcomes are as the moral standard for what their actions did. And largely, we cannot ever know what it's going to do, but we can always just have good intentions. We never know what our actions are actually going to do. Another huge problem is, again, ethnocentrism, because for the good of the many and for the good of the people does not often include everyone. This can sometimes exclude very specific people, aka marginalized societies. That's literally why they're called marginalized. But, you know, everything has problems. Can't get too heated about it right now. <laughs> but largely because we cannot see into the future, we can always say that our intentions were good. And so with consequentialism, we can make perfectly awesome excuses that no, my intentions were so good. I thought the outcome was going to be so much better than what it was actually in reality. And so with this uh, lies problems with consequentialism. And so to our example of if you're a super being, should you be a superhero, what would a consequentialist say? Likely, yes. <laughs> If we are maximizing pleasure or happiness and minimizing pain and unhappiness, we are to look toward what would be the best outcome for the best am amount of people. Additionally, if you're an especially good superhero, you will also take into consideration everything, including civilians, property, property inside of civilians, aka Captain America Civil War. So the maximum and minimum emphasis on minimum pain, a good superhero of utilitarianism would look to be perfect and not get anyone hurt. The largest difference between act utilitarianism and rule utilitarianism is the quality over quantity argument. And so if you're a superhero and you see like the doctor who can cure cancer, and a bus full of civilians, and they're both hanging on a thread, you can only choose one, which would you choose? 
A rural utilitarianist would look at quality over quantity and would probably automatically save the doctor, whereas an act utilitarianist will look at quantity over quality and will probably head toward the bus full of people. But again, a good utilitarianist thinks of everything, including all of the people that that doctor can potentially save with their you know, singular, unique cure for cancer. You know, he's the only one, or they. And so good utilitarianists would probably still save the doctor. Um, just saying. But a bad act utilitarianist or a short-sighted utilitarianist might just save the many over the one, considering the many over the one is a very strong, big argument that, is, is, you know... I don't want to give any spoilers for anyone who hasn't seen the entire Marvel Universe, which I don't know how many people haven't, it's fantastic, but this entire argument is seen in Captain America Civil War, which dates back to, to earlier movies in the franchise of, you know, should you have, have hurt so many civilians? So many civilians got hurt. What are you doing? Are you a bad superhero or a good superhero? So I would encourage you to watch all of those and maybe we'll, watch, we'll make a little video about who's right, Iron Man or Captain America. But for today, I do want to say that Iron Man, Tony Stark, was for rule utilitarianism, whereas Captain America was for act utilitarianism. So interesting thoughts to consider for the future. In Maoist consequentialism, we are to promote universal love and condemn aggression. And considering a superhero with these two very core principles, we might see something very different than a classic Marvel superhero. We might see someone more not really being aggressive and maybe using, using their words more. <laughs> but largely, we can consider what if they were to have to protect their civilization from Com complete destruction. In that case, social intentions, social goodness, universal love might, might go over aggression, condemning aggression. And with that, they'll use the core doctrine of moderation in use. And if they have to make people bleed, they will be in great moderation. Okay? So... Knowing very little about Moist philosophy, please let me know if you would think otherwise. Otherwise, uh, they sound like a, a pretty cool superhero. Very peaceful. Last but certainly not least is deontological ethics, to which if you're trying to memorize all these, just remember D for duty. Deontological ethics. Deontological ethics originates from the very famous philosopher Immanuel Kant, who is a German philosopher from a city in Prussia, which is also present-day Russia, 1724 to 1804. Deontology, funny enough, did not originate in ancient civilizations, but I do want to mention someone who added onto it after Kant, as it does, you know, get brought up very often in learning about the philosophy. And this is a Sir William David Ross, or David or W.D. Ross, who is a Scottish philosopher who largely lived his adulthood in England and lived from 1877 to 1971, so a very, very long time. Deontology's principle is that it is a duty-based ethics, also sometimes called a rules-based ethics. And this is that we have a duty to ourselves and our fellow people, and we are to act in accordance to this. This may sound very familiar to say, you know, religious duties or divine command theory, where our actions are good when they are and abides by God's will. Um, but the first person to define deontology was Immanuel Kant, which is very, very specific specific steps. Different. So unlike the other two main schools of normative ethics, deontology was not created in an ancient civilization, but much, 
much more recent by a certain Immanuel Kant. The application of deontology can be found in Kant's three categorical imperatives. First, universal laws. Act only according to that maxim by which you can also will that it will become a universal law. Second, don't use people. Act in such a way that you always treat humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of any other, never simply as a means, but always at the same time as an end. Third, the kingdom of ends. Every rational being must so act as if he were, through his maxim, always a legislating member in a universal kingdom of ends. The last one here just is the first two put together, which, as a universal law, don't use people. Easy as that. <laughs> and then later, W.D. Ross added his deontological pluralism, which is prima facie, an absolute duty, which means prima facie, self-evident moral duties that can be applied to multiple situations, and absolute duty, which are case-by-case -case moral duties that have to be carefully evaluated. And so in this pluralism, it is either complex or not complex. <laughs> And in building his deontology, Kant also pointed to consequentialism as humans cannot foresee the future. The outcome of our actions should not at all be considered when doing something right. If the outcomes may look bad, know that it is your duty to do the right thing instead. One of the largest criticisms to deontology is that it looks to universal laws. However, there are no universal laws. If we look across the entire world of all of the laws, maybe there's a few. Don't kill people? And maybe there's one. And in what circumstances do we not kill people? This is, this is why it's not a universal law. And so once again, ethnocentrism reigns high over our moral duties, values, rules, or outcomes in everything that we may think and see. And so if you think about your own culture as the best, stop. <laughs> They're different. And so once more, if you are a super being, are you supposed to be a superhero? In deontology, Kant's specific rules of categorical imperatives can also be called Kantism as a school of philosophy in and of itself. And so with that, in Kantism, superheroes would have to judge themselves by three very specific questions. Could this action be made into a universal law? Am I using someone as a means to an end? Am I protecting and respecting everyone's autonomy? And so with these questions in mind, a Kantist superhero would likely want to act extremely perfectly in what they do should be universally applied. What they do, everyone should do, if they're a superhero and capable. Kantist superheroes would of course include themselves in making universal laws and not using anyone's as a means to an end, but when you think about it, if you are humanity's last hope for survival and everything, you know, all is gone if not for you, it is very likely that one would forgo the using yourself as a means to an end and think that this should be a universal law. If you're the last one, then you're the last one. Everyone else will live but you, and that's great. Superhero stuff. But more than obviously, a superhero would never use another person as a human shield in a means of an end situation. This is a bad guy thing to do. And so pretty much in any uh, school of moral philosophy, a superhero wouldn't do that. But especially a Kantian superhero, they would never use anyone as a means to an end. A human shield would never be a thing. But more importantly, a Kantian superhero wouldn't have a line of pawns like a chessboard in the real-life game of war. So, that's important. 
In a very weird way, respecting and protecting everyone's autonomy in world-ending situations is a, a fickle situation, as you could entirely protect their decision to let the world end. But in the very famous case of Nader v. Friedman, sometimes people don't need that freedom. If a very small group of people are like, you're taking away our freedom to allow the world to end, the freedom of future generations' choices would be entirely taken away if we just let it end. So, we always have to save the world, even if it's taking away the freedom to end the world. You know, just, just saying there very weird case of Nader v. Friedman to superhero, uh, so I'd love to know what you'd think there. And then what's interesting to think about Ross's deontological pluralism is the difference between prima facie and absolute duty, to where, when you think about it, should a superhero just jump at the chance of saving someone? Have you ever seen it in an instance where it's like, you weren't saving me. <laughs> so just think about the entire beginning of the Incredibles movie. Sometimes there are very cut and dry situations, but others might be more intricate, more carefully sought out. Just a just an example of should you go in guns a blazing or should you think about it? We have to know which situation this is when being uh, dutiful to our human being world. And that is it, guys. That is all three of the main schools of normative ethics. There are many other schools. There is sometimes four main schools, but care ethics is actually much newer than any of the other ones, even deontology, so... If you want to talk about the care ethics at some point, I'd love to. Most of my profs kind of skipped it, so I did too. Um, anyways, I really hope you enjoyed the video, and I'd love to know what you would think about which of these philosophies you are. If you were to ask me which of these is the best one or the least best one, I just want to say this. How about we follow all three of them? How about we have virtues, we look to the consequences for, you know, things that are bad, maybe not look for the super good ones and see to it that we get them, but more importantly, have a duty to our fellow mankind and see to it that we are some sort of golden rule of making universal laws and not using people as a means to an end. All three would be the answer of which is best. And all three would be the answer of which is the least best. Because if you only use one, there are a lot of problems with it. But if you use all of them, the problems might just go away. Of course, the giant asterisks of ethnocentrism, which cannot be accepted. If you are ethnocentric, go away. And that's it. That's it, everybody. I hope you had a super fun time with the video. I have no idea how long this is going to be because I've been recording for two hours. What? If you're all the way here to the very, very end, I super duper appreciate it and I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. Again, super appreciate you taking a minute to learn about ethics. So go out there and be a good person. Uh, I guess. Oh, Alright. Thanks Let again. Bye. Me. I love you. Oh, one of these days that will never end. That you seem to spend for hours on end. Switching back and forth. 10 inch, 67 inch, 4 inch, 4K, 1080p. You're wasting your time. Not making friends. You don't understand. What did they all go? Now what you have to say and stuff for all.